This is section 6.2, part 2. Just finished example 10 on the first part, and we're picking up from there. It says that since many applied problems involve angles that are not acute, because a lot of what we've done so far has been based on things less than 90 degrees, it is necessary to extend the definition of the trigonometric functions. We make this extension by placing our angle in standard position. Um, so theta is, remember, going to start its initial side on the x-axis, the positive side. And then we rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on if we're talking about a positive or a negative angle. And the terminal side can move all the way around in any of the quadrants. So if it's acute, it's going to be in quadrant one. Now, we can actually talk about this by picking a point on both of the sides of the actual um, angles, the rays. We can create what's called a perpendicular line. So this is going to now have a 90 degree angle by dropping down ver uh, just completely perpendicular from one point to the next. So what this does is creates a triangle, which means we can now define trig in terms of the following things. The x length, the y length, and then this is r, because if we imagine this rotating all the way around, it's like a radius of a circle. So it gives us, and our hypotenuse now is r. So now sine theta, which is opposite over hype, so that would be y over r, Cosine theta is adjacent over hype, which would be x over r, and tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, which would be y over x. So this is interesting because if your circle has radius 1, then you would just have y for sine and x for cosine. That's just this ordered pair, this point p. Um, if you have a different radius, obviously you'll get a fraction there. So we're going to define the six trig functions so that their values agree with those given previously whenever the angle is acute. Now this seems like a small feat and a small piece of information, but this is a super powerful tool to be able to put an angle in a standard position and then talk about the triangle's trig ratios. So it is understood that if a zero denominator occurs any time while you're around the whole quadrants, then you're going to get an undefined function. So that happens anytime either x or y could possibly be zero because those are the times that you get zero. We wouldn't be talking about a radius of zero because that would make no sense. That would be a singular point at the origin since our radius would be nothing. Um, so the distance between the origin and the point x on the actual, so remember they had the picture drawn. So here's the origin O and somewhere along our last ray we had a point P. This distance right here, remember, is r. So r is actually just Pythagorean theorem. It's x squared. That's like a squared here. So this is our x. And then b squared, which is our y, equals r squared. And they just took the square root to solve for that. So that's how we're going to find our radius, if it is not known. Um, and then sine theta we said was y over r, cosine of theta was x over r, and tangent of theta was y over x as long as x is not zero. If that happens, it'll be undefined. And then remember cosecant, secant, and cotangent are just the flipped reciprocals of each of those. Now, what this then leads us into is a discussion of domains, because obviously if you're dividing by zero at certain places in the x-y axis, which we're going to show you where that happens in just a second, then you have undefined values, and undefined values mean that you can't talk about a domain there. You have no domain there. You're restricted. So when we go to graph trig functions a little bit later, you'll see that those restricted domains cause problems when we graph. So sine and cosine, because they both have r as their denominator, and r is never zero since it's a radius, is going to be any angle we want to plug in. So sine and cosine are defined for any angle. Tangent and secant are every angle except for pi over 2 plus pi n. That means that 90 degrees. So let's talk about why is 90 degrees an issue. So up here, imagine just a radius of 1, and let's say this is the ordered pair, then 0, 1. When you make the tangent theta ratio, you do y over x, which would be 1 over 0. We're dividing by 0 here. That's undefined. Now. If you have 1, 0, you'd be fine, because this would be 0 over 1. Excuse me, this would be negative 1, 0, so 0 over negative 1. And over here is also fine. This is going to be 1, 0, because you're going to have 0 over 1. 
but again, down at the bottom, you get 0, negative 1. So when you do y over x, you get negative 1 over 0, which is undefined. So tangent theta and secant theta, because it also has an x in its denominator, if we look back up at the list, see, secant also has an x in the denominator. So tangent and secant are not defined at 90 degrees and then 180 rotations over and over again. So if you go any half circle and you hit either of those locations again, so even if we are, you know, rotating many times, if we ever end up on the y-axis essentially as our terminal side, you can't do tangent or secant. So that's what this represents. This pi over 2 is the original undefined location plus any rotation of 180 degrees or pi if you want to think of it in radians. So that's two different ways of writing it, one with radians, one with degrees. Cotangent and cosecant are also going to have restrictions because they're not going to be defined anywhere y is 0. So in this case, y can't be 0, and remember this case, x can't be 0. Because cotangent and cosecant both have y's in their denominator. So that's going to end up being at 0 degrees and at 180 because that's when you would get um, a y of 0. It's going to be at the x-axis point. So every angle except theta can't be pi n, which means 180 times any rotation we want to do. So pretty much 0 degrees, 180, you know, add another 180 to that, 360, add another 180. Any time we go around 180 from one of those locations, you've reached another undefined value. Now, this little side discussion doesn't seem very important right now, but domain is going to be extremely important for us later. So it's defined right now, but we will continue to bring it up over and over again until it starts to make more sense. Um, for any point P in the preceding definition, as long as your absolute value is less than or equal to R of X and of Y, we also know that X over Y has to be less than or equal to 1 then, because they divide R over and y over r is less than or equal to 1. So they're just setting up some parameters. They're saying that sine and cosine, their absolute values, is always less than or equal to 1, which means every sine value and cosine value will fluctuate, which I can't spell today, from negative 1 to, uh, to 1. I will rewrite that. We will just say varies. It's easier than fluctuates. So everything sine theta and cosine theta will vary, vary from negative 1 to 1, nothing outside of that. So you can't have like negative 3. That's not a sine theta. You can't have a positive 5. That's too big to be cosine theta. Now cosecant and secant are the opposite of those. Remember, they're the reciprocals. So they actually are always bigger than or equal to 1 or bigger than or equal, or I should say smaller than or equal to negative 1. Their distances are farther away. Um, so this will not be something you have to memorize right now, but this is going to show up when we try to graph. So we'll see this visually in class in the coming weeks. All right, so back to some examples. So that a lot of that was just some definitions and groundwork that we needed to know for things coming down the road. This one doesn't need a lot of those facts. We just need to figure out if we can find out the trig functions. So it says, number 11, an ex angle theta in standard position on a rectangular coordinate system and a point P. So the most important part of this is the point P. So let's think about where that would be plotted. So negative 15. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I added that one in. And then up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's a rough estimate of where that point would be. All right, so here's my, uh, remember, initial side of my angle. And then I go and rotate until my origin connects to this point. Okay, so this is this is my theta that they gave me, um, but we're looking for a reference angle. We're going to call this theta r that says we want to reference this down to the triangle that it's inside because you don't really want to draw a big obtuse triangle. We want to draw a right triangle. To draw a right triangle, you just drop this point down to the nearest x-axis point, and that creates a right angle. We know that this side is 8 tall because it has to do with this right here. This side is negative 15 in its measurement because it's negative 15 because it's to the left. 
All we need to be able to find our six trig ratios is to think about this hypotenuse. So if we take this and we write 8 squared plus negative 15 squared equals c squared, because we are looking for the hype, or r squared if you want to think of it that way. We can call it r now since we've defined it that way. Let's change it to r. So this would be 64 plus, I believe, 225. And add those together and then see what the square root is. I believe this one comes out nicely. Yeah, that's 289, which is a perfect square. And the answer is 17. Now, I know that I wrote negative 15 here. That's really to help us down the road um, because I always like to make sure I have the right signs because when you make trig ratios, the signs do matter because that will tell you whether or not your trig ratio is positive or negative. In quadrant 2 over here, x's are negative, y's are positive. Something to note is that the radius or the hypotenuse is always a positive measurement no matter which quadrant you're in. The only things that can be positive or negative and fluctuate is your x's and your y's, and that depends on what quadrant you're in. So let's talk about this really quick. Um, sine of our reference angle, which is this theta right here, is going to be, remember, just opposite over hype. So that'd be 8 over 17. Cosine of my theta is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So negative uh, 15 over 17. My tangent of my theta is going to be opposite over adjacent. And then remember, we just flip each of these for the reciprocals. So this would be 17 over 8, negative 17 over 15, and negative 15 over 8. So that's all of those. So just placing it on its, you know, standard position that gives us kind of a, the, what we call the original measurement of the angle, but we can always draw a little right triangle in the quadrant and get the trig ratios from that reference angle. All right, so the definition of the trig functions of any angle may be applied if theta is quadrantal. Remember, that's an angle that um, is on either the x-axis or the y-axis. So if theta is 3 pi over 2, let's find all the trig ratios. So 3 pi over 2, in case you're not referencing that yet visually, we can change that to degrees. Sometimes that helps people. Um, so this would be 180 over pi. Those are going to cancel. That would make that 90. So this is 270 degrees, just to kind of help you out if you're not as good with the radians yet. So remember, every time you go one place up, so like if you go into and from the x-axis to the y-axis, you've gone 90 degrees. So this is 90 degrees. This would be 180. This is 270. So my point is down here. So this is actually my point. Um, so the thing is, when we talk about this, this is we don't know the x value or the y value. They didn't give us a single value. We can pick an x and y, and I always just pick 0 and then the 1 or negative 1, whatever I'm at, because they didn't specify what the radius had to be or what the point had to be. So you're just on this. You can pick any p on this part of the quadrant. So I'm picking that. So then this is x and this is y. So remember, sine of theta, or 3 pi over 2 for us, cosine of 3 pi over 2, tangent of 3 pi over 2. Remember, sine is supposed to be y over r, cosine is x over r, and tangent is y over x. So y over r would be negative 1 over negative, or positive 1 for the radius, which would just be negative 1. Uh, cosine would be 0 over 1, which is just going to be 0. And then we get into trouble with tangent because you get negative 1 over 0. So this is undefined. Now we want to do the other pieces. So we have cosecant of 3 pi over 2. Sorry, my pen's acting a little ish, a little bit glitchy today. There we go. It's not wanting to draw. So cosecant of 3 pi over 2. Secant of 3 pi over 2 and cotangent of 3 pi over 2. 
you just flip them. So this would still be negative 1. This now would be 1 over 0. So this one's actually going to be undefined. So here's something interesting. If one of them is 0, the reciprocal is undefined. Same thing for tangent. If it's undefined, if you flip it, 0 goes back up on top. So these just flip-flop based on being reciprocals, where the zero is either on top or on bottom. Okay, so now we've, I've kind of alluded to this, but we want to make sure you understand the sign associations with each trig function. So in quadrant one, all of your sine functions, uh, cosine functions, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent, all of them come out as positive ratios. The reason for that is quadrant one is always positive x's, positive y's and r is always positive we said radius is always positive in quadrant two you get that the x's are negative but the y's are positive that's going to require some of these to be split so notice sine and cosecant which are reciprocals of each other are positive but everything else is negative in tan, uh, quadrant three everything is negative for x's and y's so the only time you get a positive is when you put an x and a y in the same ratio that's why tangent and cotangent end up being positive and everything else becomes negative. And then in quadrant four, you have a positive x and a negative y. So notice cosine and its reciprocal will be positive and everything else will be negative. Now that's really hard to memorize from that ch uh, chart. So here's how I do it. We have this little chart down here that's more visual. This says that um, in quadrant one, everything is positive. So this tells you that all are positive. In quadrant two, sine and cosecant are positive. In quadrant three, only tangent and cotangent are positive. And in quadrant four, only cosine and secant are positive. So the way I have students remember this is to go around this one, two, three, four. So all science teachers are crazy. So the R you have to put in there. So all science teachers, crazy. The R is just to make it sound more like a sentence. So this helps you remember which ones are positive. Everything, the sine family, the tangent family, and the cosine family. When I say family, I mean the reciprocals are included. So that helps you remember when things are positive. If something is not listed, remember it's negative in that region. And all of that has to do with sine ratios. When you put things together into ratios, certain signs are going to pop up depending on if the top and bottom are negative or positive. So that's how that came about. Okay, so let's talk about this. So we actually will use this sometimes in definitions. So find the quadrant theta containing um, if both cosine is theta is positive, so greater than zero. So cosine theta is positive but sine theta is negative because it's less than zero. So what quadrant would that be? Well, cosine is only positive in one and two because everything's positive in one, or sorry, not one and two, one and four. So um, cosine is positive in one because everything's positive here and in four. So cosine is positive down here, cosine is positive when everything is positive. When out of those two cases, the only time sine can be negative is not going to be the top one because everything's positive up here. So it has to be quadrant four. So this is really important because sometimes in your directions, all they're going to tell you is something like this, and you have to figure out where to draw your right triangle. So it's really important to know where your signs are. All right, so let's look at this and let's how, see how we could use this. So if sine of theta is three over five, and tangent theta, we don't know the answer to it, but we know it's negative, because remember, less than zero means negative. Use the fundamental identities to find the values of the other five trig functions. Okay, so we already know sine theta is three over five, which means I immediately know cosecant of theta, because that's its reciprocal, is five over three. So what I need to figure out is cosine theta, secant theta, tangent theta, and cotangent theta. But the problem is you can't just draw any random triangle you want and then start making labels. You have to have this in the right quadrant. So let's go up here and look. Sine here is positive. They don't actually say that, but the fraction is three over five, which is positive. So we're looking for a place where sine is positive, but tangent is negative. So sine is positive in quadrant one and in quadrant two. Tangent would be positive also in quadrant one. So 
tangent, since it's not listed here, has to be negative in quadrant two. So we're looking at a quad two picture. That's what we need to draw. So because of this information right here, I've determined I need to be in quadrant two. Once you know that, it's safe to draw the picture. And you don't have to draw this to scale. You just make up your theta is always connected to the origin. And you say, okay, since sine is opposite over hype, that means across would be three, and hype is always, remember, the radius. So that's that one. Now we can actually find this x value. So, And we do have to remember that in this quadrant, x is our negative, y is our positive. So no matter what, I already know that this is a negative because x is, should be negative over here. So when we look at this, we get, let's see, this would be a squared plus, we don't know what b is yet, and then equals c squared. So this is 9 plus x squared equals 25, and this would be x squared equals 16, and that's literally plus or minus the square root of 16, so plus or minus 4. But we already know we're supposed to be choosing the negative case because of the quadrant that we're in. So that's the most important part about having the quadrant right, is getting your sign correct. So in quad 2, y's are positive, x's are negative, and r is always positive. So we've got this labeled correctly. Now we can write the rest of our ratios. So cosine, remember, is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's negative 4 over 5. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so 3 over negative 4, so that's just going to be negative 3 fourths. And then we just flip, so negative 5 over 4 and negative 4 over 3. We have now located the correct trig, or trig um, function values for each of our uh, trig statements. So this is really, really important. So that's why after you guys watch these two videos, because there was a part one and a part two, we said that on Tuesday's class, we're going to have a worksheet that has some similar examples to this. Please bring your notes with you. I want you guys talking in class, uh, working through some problems together, and then we'll cover the new notes that I'm going to be posting soon. So have a good day, and I'll see you on Tuesday.